Hey everybody, this is Ryan Mallory with Swing Trading the Stock Market, now on my YouTube channel. So if you're listening to this on the traditional podcast platforms like Apple iTunes, definitely check it out on the YouTube channel that I have. It's youtube.com slash share planner. You'll be able to see this pretty cool backdrop. It got all my bourbons in the background and uh, all the ones that I reviewed and not the real bad ones like Raven's Lace. I won't put that sucker on the shelf. Don't worry, you'll never see it on here. But some of my favorites and some of the just like the, the ho-hum regular ones. I put them all back there. And it also gives me a chance to provide you my podcast on a different platform using videography. So we're going to get this one started here. This email today is going to come from Frankie. Now, Frankie's actually his real name. I'm not going to change it. His name was so great. He signed it, Frankie from Down Under. I said, how am I going to actually be able to improve upon his name at all? I'm not going to give him a Florida redneck name. He's still Frankie from Down Under. Maybe he's from New Zealand. Maybe he's from Australia. I think Australia is where the Down Under term comes from. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say he's from Australia. All right, so let's read his email here, and then I'll go ahead and get into the whiskeys. Dear Ryan, I recently found your podcast, and I am enjoying listening to them when I go on my walks. My question is, how many months or years of data do you need to be convinced that you're ready to trade full-time, and what sort of stats should i be aiming for also what statistics what statistics should i record i currently have nearly two years of data 20 months to be exact and have made 106 trades for 56 wins 53 percent win percentage and my average gain is about 20 percent versus an average loss of nine percent the graph is definitely trending in the right direction but not sure if this is enough sample size to give up the day job and give trading a real go with Love it if you could dedicate one of your episodes to this topic. Regards, Frankie from Down Under. Well, Frankie, we're going to do the first podcast on YouTube based off of your email. I thought it was really good. And honestly, he I mean, he's hes a lot further ahead than he realizes, so I'm excited about that. He sounds like he's really making a legitimate effort to becoming a full-time trader. My whiskey for the day, it's a bourbon. This is Calumet Farm, 14 years old. You can see I've had a little bit of it already, but I've, I've held off on scoring it, okay? This one was bottled back in March of 2006. Calumet Farms, they're actually into horse racing. I think they've won, according to the back of this bottle, they said they've won two Triple Crowns and eight Kentucky Derbies. That's pretty impressive. I'm no horsing expert, but let me tell you, winning a Triple Crown is some big-time stuff, much less do it twice. So we're going to pop the top off of this sucker. Give it a nice little pour. These are my Glenn Claire glasses. I love these suckers, man. Keep that right there for you guys. Price point on it. It's kind of on the high side. I, I bought it for a special occasion, $122. Um, kind of a hard one to find, too. Really. Really good. You know, it, it, it's funny. When you breathe it in at first, it's got this, like, nice... Oreo flavor on the smell. I mean, it, the smell is really nice, and it, the taste has this like real nice honey flavor. Really good. I really like it a lot. And then it like finishes off with a little bit of little bit of spice and a little bit of cinnamon. So I like it a lot. I mean, I can see why they they price it as high as they do. It's a solid bottle. One of those special occasion bottles. The last episode I talked about Elijah Craig small batch being one of those like weekday sippers. This is like. Not even weekend sippers. This is this is more like special occasion sippers. Like you want to commemorate something. You pull out this Calumet Farm 14 year. Pretty good stuff. As for my rating, I'm going to give it an 8-1. I think it's very solid. I don't think it's like the best of the best. I don't think it's up there with Blanton's. But I do think it's got a real nice rich flavor to it. I think the smells were great. The color is like beautiful on it. So 8.1. That's it. All right. So. Frankie from down under here, he's been doing this for about 20 months now. It's not a ton of experience. And you got to remember, 20 months ago takes us back to late 2019. So you're talking about quarter four 2019. He's been doing this while he's working. Again, he wants to quit his job. He's got very nice statistics here. Why I would say that his statistics, while they may be pretty solid and something that you could trade off of, when you go from part-time trading to full-time trading, it opens up a whole other set of challenges. For one, you're not just building your profits day after day, week after week anymore. You're taking from those profits to live on. 
So you may not be building your portfolio at all. In fact, sometimes if you've got to pay the mortgage, you're going to be dipping into your trading account if you're not having a good month. So those are some of the challenges. It gets much more emotional from a from a human standpoint, from a day-to-day trying to live standpoint. And so that can also inject a lot of emotions into it. What I would tell Frankie here, because he's been trading for the better part of a year and some phenomenal trading conditions, not, not the whole time, but there's been many months where, I mean, take, take April of last year, we were up 11%. It was the greatest April since 1938. That's, that's hard stuff to come by. That doesn't happen every day. In that rally, in the midst of a pandemic, market rally is like 75% off its lows. That's not normal either. So I'm a little bit concerned about judging it off of this pandemic, especially when most of your trading experience comes from it. And one of the things that I would want to see from a trader, if I'm in that person's shoes, one of the things that I would want to see as a trader would be how do I do in different market cycles? You really need to see a number of different market cycles. There was one back in 2018 that I thought was phenomenal. A lot of people lost a lot of money in, but it was also a really good market to short. That was one of my best periods for shorting the stock market that I've ever had. It was just really, really solid. And it made my year. Most people finished way down on the year. I finished way up. It was a good year for me. That, that deserves a sip. So we've been in mainly a bullish market for most of this guy's trading existence. You had late February and most of March where the market was down and it was down ferociously, but it didn't last long. It forgave you really quick. So during that time, and there was a lot of you guys out there that I'm sure could say, yeah, you'd raise your hand and say that that's probably me too. You were one of those people that Probably didn't sell at times when you should have. I got stopped out of some stocks, and I got stopped out way at the top of the the sell-off. When the sell-off started happening, I got knocked out of everything. And then the market just fell all over itself for the three or four weeks that followed before it finally put in a bottom on March 23rd, 2020. And what what you got there was a lot of forgiveness from the market because you had the sharp bounce. You I think at the bottom, the market rallied something like 12 or 13%. It was a crazy one-day rally. They forgave a lot of people, and then it just kept rallying higher. And as a result, people were able to be made whole again on the market. It made you almost feel like, okay, I got away with one there. I didn't have to use the stop loss. It didn't blow me up. The market came right back up. And then you probably made money off of those positions. Let's think like if you held Apple all the way through, you're better off for it today. Does that mean that's a good long-term strategy of doing that with every stock that you trade? No. But for that period, that little blip, if you want to call it, from late February to late March, the market lets you get away with one in a very, very big way. If that had been 2000, when the NASDAQ spent the next couple of years falling like 87%, you wouldn't be saying that. And I lived and traded through that. I also lived and traded through the 2008 recession. I know what can happen if a Recession does kick in and the market takes a sustained period of time selling off. Something's never come back. It took Qualcomm like 15, 16 years just to break its all-time highs from 2000. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You you don't always come out whole when you ignore your stop losses. That's why I use these stop losses. So I don't want to get too sidetracked onto the stop loss route because there's there's tons of podcasts where I talk about that. But I do want to encourage Frankie from down under is don't be so quick to quit the job. Try to see some more market cycles. See how you do in like an extended bearish setting. See how you do in a lot of sustained sideways patterns. Like you take the 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 charts from Facebook, not not from the past week, but August through February of this past year. You take Facebook, you take Amazon, you take Netflix still is in this nasty sideways channel. And you take some of these charts and you get a market that's like that as well, you're not going to be extracting the same amount of profits as you did from the the stock market as you did this past year when the market put its lows in on March 23rd and has been rallying ever since. Those FANG stocks became very difficult and provided very little opportunity to profit from them, right? And so while you could avoid those stocks altogether, what if the whole market does that to where most of your stocks are doing that? then your profit opportunities are going to become far less. But he talks about, he, he has 
He has a 53% winning percentage. He's keeping track of all the things. The one thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is his average game versus his average loss. It's 20% versus 9%. I'm a little bit concerned about that because it seems to me that he's trading with a lot of volatility. You got to remember, if he says his average loss is 9%, doesn't mean that he's just losing 9% on every one of his losing trades. It means that he's probably going a little bit above it and a little bit below it. And I'm hoping there's no like major outliers there, like something that's like 50%. I want to see them all be like 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then maybe 10, 11, 12% losses. They need to be around that 9% area. You don't want these big outliers because those take forever to come back from. So he's going to have to see what kind of volatility he's trading on. Because when you start doing that over many, many years, you're going to eventually get burned on it. And you may not get burned on it within a 20-month period. But the extreme volatility usually means that there's a lot more risk to the stock itself. Not just to the chart, but to the stock itself. And that's why there's so much volatility to it. And you can easily get caught on the wrong side of the trade where it gaps down 20%. And then you're talking about a big, big loser. For me, I try to stay away from these stocks. I don't want to take a 9% loss if I don't have to. In certain markets, you have to expand your stop loss a little bit, but not by a ton. If I'm going back to March of last year, yeah, I probably have to start, if the market's looking like it's going to base, there's going to be some really wild swings there. And if it's basing, maybe I take a little bit of wider stop loss. But in this market here where we're sitting at all-time highs, I'm not taking 9% stops. I'm just not going to do it because the, the the reward potential is not there right now in the stock market where it doesn't appear to be there. It may still be there, but it doesn't appear to be there. So that's something to be concerned about. And, and also, like if your average win is going to be 20%, there's going to be some stocks that you get out for. It just doesn't do anything for you. You're like, okay, I've been sitting at 2% gains forever. It's just there's an opportunity cost there. I'm moving on to the next trade. So you know, you take a 2% profit while it's still a profit, it's going to bring down that 20% win rate from wherever it was. So that's going to weigh on it. So that also means too, he's probably dealing with some really big winners and that's good that he is. But again, it comes back to what kind of stocks are you trading? Are you making this off a of GME? Are you making it off a of BlackBerry? Making it off of AMC? That's why I like all these details in these emails because it really does help me. The more details that you give me in an email like this, the better. I don't need the whole trading plan, but um, it definitely... It helps me dissect where that 20% and 9% is coming from. The other thing too is like, I mean, I have losing streaks all the time. Okay. We all do as traders. If you do this long enough, you're going to have your share of losing streaks. There's been times where I've had seven, eight, nine losses in a row. And you're like, should I just trade opposite of everything that I think I should be doing? And I think a lot of people think that they start to wonder, man, I should just do everything that I think that I should be doing, but do the opposite of it. And and that's a valid emotion. I think everybody deals with that. But what do you do when you start getting with an average loss of 9%? What do you start doing when you have a drawdown? Your drawdowns are going to be a lot bigger. So that's something else that Frankie from Down Under has to think about. If I get into this market and I'm just finding myself on the wrong side of the market and I have 9% loss after 9% loss, maybe there's a 15% loss in there somewhere. What, what do you do? And usually when the market starts to pull pull back and go against your long positions, you're not going to have so many like two or 3% losses when your average loss is about 9%. You're going to start stopping out at all those stop losses. And then if you have a couple of gap downs below it, then it's going to be even worse. So your average loss is going to be bigger usually in drawdowns. How do I know this? Because this is stuff that I've all experienced, man. I've, I've been on the bad side of trades. I've been on the bad side of drawdowns, all that stuff. There's honestly no good side of a drawdown. They're all bad. Again, let's get back to the main point. He wants to know when can he quit his job to become a full-time trader? It's also going to depend on money too because the money, if, if you're trading with a million dollars and you make 1% on your trade and you're trading $100,000 on each trade, which would be 10% of your capital, that 1% is going to equate to about $1,000. If you make 20% on your trade like Frankie from Down Under is doing, well, then all of a sudden he's making $20,000 on a trade. And guess what? you can sustain yourself much easier with a much bigger portfolio. And that's just simple math. That's obvious, right? But you want to make sure that you're not trading with $100,000 for a full-time, with a full-time account. And you're trading about 10% of your portfolio on a trade and you make 20%. So then that $10,000 gives you $2,000, but your monthly needs are like $10,000 a month that you need to, to live. You're going to have to find ways to cut expenses because the the issue is going to be it's putting a lot of pressure on you to make winning trades. I don't like the pressure of having to make a winning trade every time I step up to the batter's box, okay? 
I know that I'm going to have my share of winners. I'm going to have my share of losers. But I don't want to have to put the pressure on me. It's like I have to have this trade in order to make it work. And when you quit your job and you become a full-time trader, there needs to be some cushion. So what I would tell Frankie from down under here is that if he's at a place where he's ready to quit, and only he's going to know this for sure, he's got to be the one that's comfortable. It can't be coming from me or from anybody else. When I did it, I was comfortable with it. When I also did it, there was a lot of people who were not comfortable with it. I remember my boss telling me, he's like, oh, you know, it's a bear market right now. I was like, ah. Who cares? I short the market, <laughs> bear markets. But um, you got to be comfortable with it. And what I would recommend doing is saving up some vacation time if you get those benefits and maybe try to save up like two weeks of vacation time and take a vacation, a staycation, right? I just learned that term the other day, a staycation. And you just trade for about two weeks on your own and just to see and feel what that's like. What's that pressure like? And see if you can make enough for yourself during that time to support yourself for like a month. That would be a good sign. If two weeks of trading, you can support yourself for a month, that would be a good sign right there. But again, you got to be comfortable with it. You got to realize too, that there's going to be market cycles. There's going to be times when you're caught on the wrong side of the trade and you can go for an extended period of time and be consistently making money. It's not always going to happen, but there's times where you can get really lucky or you can just be very fortunate. So you want to make sure that you're experiencing different market cycles. The sideways trading patterns that that just never seems to really give you any good opportunities. And then going through the whole transition of a bullish market to a bearish market to where all of a sudden the market, which thought looked or thought or felt that it was unstoppable, is all of a sudden just capitulating and falling all over itself. Also, too, I would tell Frankie from down under the stats that you should be recording. Uh, he, he's doing the, he's doing a pretty good job of the stats that he's recording, but also like record your uh, initial stop loss. That's that's also an important. Sometimes people will look at the max amount of profit that they could have had it in the trade versus what they actually came out at. So if you could have had, a, let's say your average stock you bought in at a hundred dollars and it goes up to one hundred and twenty dollars, but you're walking away at an average price of $105. Well, then you know you're like leaving a lot of money on the table there. That's like 75% of the potential profits are being lost. So you're not managing the trade very well throughout the process. If you start seeing those trends, and that's really what you're trying to do with your track record is to look at the trends. Also, if Frankie is going to be quitting his job, he needs to be signing up for my YouTube channel membership just below this table here, right below this on the YouTube channel. Sign up for it. It's really good. You're going to be getting every day my daily trade setups. They're awesome. It's going to tell you which stocks I'm looking to potentially trade each day. On top of that, you're going to get the most intriguing charts that I come across, multiple updates each week of my bullish and bearish master watch list. And then I'm going to keep you updated each week on all the FANG stocks, plus Microsoft, plus Tesla, and the S&P 500 the Russell 2000, and the NASDAQ 100. So check that all out down below. Click the join button and subscribe. But to wrap up everything that I'm talking about here with Frankie from Down Under, he's on the right path. There's no denying that. I would encourage him to try to tighten up that stop loss as much as he can. That may mean that he needs to get into a little bit less volatile stocks. Doesn't mean that you can't ever play a volatile stock. I play volatile stocks too. But you don't want your whole portfolio comprised of very, very volatile stocks. And maybe try to, if they're not volatile stocks, maybe you're holding on to them for far too long because he's only had 106 trades over the course of 20 months. I would probably assume that I would be closer to like 200 during that time span. Now, every trader is different, so I'm not trying to say that's where you should be at. But maybe some of these trades are dragging on longer than they should be. If you're in a trade for two weeks and it's not doing anything and the chart's just sort of flatlining, that's an opportunity cost from what you could be in with a different trade. So you got to make sure that you're not holding on to these trades for too long as well. Keep recording the stats. Look for problems in your trading. I know one time that I found one year that most of my losses came from constantly trying to reshort the market when I felt like it should go down and I would keep doing that and I would make like four or five trades in a single day trying to short the market. And I realized I cut this out. I am way more profitable on the year and I did and it made a difference. So definitely look for trends in your trades. What it looks like is going wrong. What kind of groupings does your losses have in terms of, is it all shorts? Are you shorting too early? Are you always trying to find the bottom in a market when the market's still dropping? Those are the kind of things that you also want to be looking for. And remember this, there's never a perfect time to quit your job and become a full-time trader. In fact, very few people do it and do it successfully. I consider myself very blessed 
I'm not sure how I got to this point in my life where I've been able to sustain it for as many years as I have, but I'm very blessed for it. It's it's awesome. I think it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of sleepless nights. There's been nights where all I do is just keep checking the futures. And that's usually a sign of some of my trading becoming undisciplined. I don't have to worry about that anymore, but there was times where I was constantly checking futures because I was I was messing up. And uh, the more of those experiences that you can have without having to be a full-time trader and you can do it in your part-time work when you're still being supplemented with a full-time job, the better off you're going to be. Now, I hope you enjoyed my first YouTube podcast. This, this setup has been a long time in the making. It's something that I have been putting together for months now. This is my first one doing it. If you enjoyed it, make sure that you like down below. It really helps this channel to really take off. It's really been very important for me to get those likes and subscribes and make sure you're getting the notifications too. And also tell me down in the box below, are you a part-time trader? And if you are a part-time trader, do you have aspirations for full-time trading? I want to hear about it. Tell me what's keeping you from being a full-time trader. Thank you guys and God bless.